type of people you bring into studies and things like that. So do you bring people who are what's hard, you know, more severe versus less severe? So that's, yeah, but it, it probably, I mean, yeah, that is a, a good point. It is, it's amazing to me how much clinical uh, does this at pharma. And it also amazes me that the FDA statisticians are not rejecting those analyses. The single worst analysis I've ever seen like this, it, it, it can actually get worse than what we just described. And so a uh, company is analyzing a four level pain scale, very common visual analog type of scale, like it, like it scale. And so you've got the numbers one to four and they calculate change in the one to four from baseline, which is not valid at all. And you'll see that in a residual plot. Uh, and they're not content with that level of damage, but they calculate the percent change from baseline in a four integer scale, four level scale, percent change from baseline. Um, and it's a good thing the baseline was, it was coded one to four, not zero to three, because your percent change could be infinite then. Um, so that practice, I don't know what is going through people's head, because that's just like, basic numeracy that's not even statistics almost um so let's let's anybody else have a comment on any of this so far hi i have a short question sure uh, you briefly mentioned uh, the change in the context of non-experimental design in the beginning and i wondered if you had some preferred approach or uh, let's say uh, preferred way of dealing with uh, an event that affected everyone is, is still considering something that uh, a law, for example, that everyone has been affected by the law and then you have some pre and post that you want to compare or assess in some way. So do you have any preferred approach for that? The, the one that I prefer, and not, nothing's fail safe, the one I prefer is that you make sure that you have enough um, span of time before the change. So you, if you measure what's going on in the week before the change, that's not gonna cut it. So let's say you had a couple of years of data before the change, and then you had some length of time after the change. And then you, um, it depends on the nature of your response variable, you can fit a time uh, relationship. So you're just modeling uh, calendar time effect. So you've got days from January 1st or whatever. Um, and you model that with a flexible spline function and you, you have a lot of knots. In other words, places where the function may change shape and you put some knots sort of near where you think the change was having effect. So, and then when you fit that curve, you're not assuming that anything changes at that point where the law went into effect, uh, but you're estimating what is the overall uh, time response profile and then you can see in a, in a kind of an unbiased way, did a change in acceleration of that curve happen to take place at the day the law went into effect? So that's related to a um, uh, interrupted uh, time series analysis. So just, to, just, to me, it's slightly better than that. But that, that still doesn't correct for not having the right uh, experimental design, but I think it's, it's still some useful uh, results. If you're able to do a pre-post pre-study, so you put in some, so you put something in effect and you take it away. And if you show your return to the base uh, level, you know, that will strengthen the result, but you, you, you won't be taking a law away, but there might be other situations where you can take an intervention away. Thank you very much. Sure, good question. So what I tried to do here is to list the assumptions that are needed if you want to use a change score. And you see there's seven assumptions and most of these are not out in the open. And um, you know, just in general, if you look at how we were all educated in school, we're taught a lot of formulas and uh, a lot of details that we quickly forget and can easily look up later. And we're really not taught how to be Sherlock Holmes. So my, my role model for statistician is Sherlock Holmes. Uh, looking beneath the surface, uh, trying to get to root causes and root explanations, um, to me is, is a super important part of statistics. So what is underneath uh, the change score? Well, the thing that you're calculating the change for 
cannot be used as an exclusion criteria for the study. And so let's suppose to get into a study, you had to have high blood pressure. And then you enroll somebody in the study and measure how much their blood pressure reduced. Well, I can guarantee it will reduce because of regression to the mean. So the reason some of the patients get into the study is because their blood pressure was mismeasured. It, or they got the patient on a bad day when they happen to be high, they don't stay that high in normal days. So when you're screening because something's high, uh, you have regression to the mean. One of the greatest examples of that, there was a very popular book that some of you may have seen. Um, I think it's called Good to Great, and it was uh, by a business professor, I believe, and chronicled um, what are the characteristics of of the big corporations that made a lot of money. And uh, so did a survey and found all these corporations that were making record profits and then wrote a book about it, what were their characteristics? Now, the problem with that is about two years after the book was written, it was not true anymore because a lot of those companies tanked. So they, they happened to be running high when the book, when the book was assembling the data the, the corporations were performing abnormally high for themselves. And then you try to learn from that and see what characteristics they were. They may be characteristics that don't matter in the long run at all. And then you write a book about it and that was just regression to the mean. Um, so if you're going to uh, have a baseline that's part of the reason that you select subjects for the study, you are now uh, forced whether you like it or not, to collect a second baseline. So you'll need to have two baseline measurements. So the, the post-enrollment baseline has to be measured some distance away from the initial baseline so that regression to the mean is not so likely. In other words, if you enroll patients because they have a high blood pressure and uh, you wait a couple of weeks and measure them again, uh, you have to be willing to withstand some of those patients no longer qualifying for your study, and, and some of them won't, but they're already in the study, and now you have a baseline that's more reflective of the real patient's blood pressure, and that's the one you would use in your change from baseline. So you're obligating yourself to go to more work if you really want to use change from baseline. And then this is a very subtle one. The post value must be linearly related to the pre value. Uh, if your change from baseline, if you're calculating something and the relationship is not linear, it doesn't really have any meaning. Uh, and then uh, not only must the relationship be linear, but you must have transformed the pre and the post uh, correctly. So let's say you should have logged the values and you didn't. Well, you'll find that the difference is going to be expanding as the pre value gets bigger. If you took a log and you shouldn't have, then the difference is going to contract as the pre-value gets bigger. So the, the subtraction, the act of subtracting two numbers is extremely dependent on how you transform the numbers before you subtract them. Now to Georgette's question, uh, the variable must not have a floor and ceiling effect. If you have a floor effect, you have nowhere to go but up. And that may look like a treatment effect, and it may just be that there's nowhere to go but up. Uh, ceiling effect the same in reverse. And so you can't have a floor and ceiling effect, and this is a mistake that's made all the time. And the residual plot and just simple distribution histograms will reveal that. But the variable must have a smooth distribution. It really needs to be interval scaled. And so a four-level ordinal pain score does not qualify uh, for something to use subtraction on. Um, and related to that, um, what is going on here is if you had an ordinal scale like pain severity, um, and you're going to subtract it from another ordinal scale, which is the pain severity at baseline, the difference in two ordinal scales is no longer ordinal. So you're actually violating uh, the data characteristics to do a subtraction. In other words, um, going from pain level three to four may mean something much worse than going from pain level two to pain level three. So, so enter, uh, enter uh, the gaps between the measurements uh, really need to mean the same thing when you're subtracting. You're treating it as interval scale and it's really not interval scale. 
And then the slope of the p-value versus the follow-up measurement must be close to one. And that's assuming that both variables are properly transformed. They're both log, they're both square rooted, cube rooted, or left alone, whatever. And so that's really seven assumptions that are really, really hard to satisfy. And we have analytical methods that don't make any of these assumptions. And why not use those? And by the way, you're gonna get better statistical power. And so this is an ethical issue. You're seeing a lot of pharmaceutical company sponsored research, a lot of research sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, where they're basing the analysis on the change score and they're having to get bigger sample sizes than doing analysis of covariance. And that's really an ethical issue. You're having to expose too many patients to the uh, new treatment. So there's two examples I mentioned here. I used to think the pre and post were typically linearly related and I found in these examples far, far from the case. And the one striking example, I looked at a, um, a study submitted to the FDA for depression drug and a lot of the depression studies use the Hamilton D depression scale, which is not, uh, not a very bad scale, it's pretty good. Uh, but they calculate change from baseline. Um, and then people start getting excited about things like heterogeneity of treatment effect. Well, the heterogeneity of treatment effect is, is mainly an artifact of using change from baseline. Um, and so what you need to realize is that um, in some diseases, the, the patients that have mild disease do not get a lot of benefit from a drug and the patients that have severe disease may be able to get major benefits. So the criticism of depression drugs, as I understand it, is there's prescribed to a lot of people with mild to moderate depression, and it doesn't do enough good to be worth side effects. Whereas there are people with severe depression where the drugs can have a major benefit. And you need to recognize that in how you analyze the data. So Reflection of that is if you plot the pre versus the post, uh, the pre versus the um, uh, post, you will see a very, very, very nonlinear relationship. It looks almost logarithmic. So if you envision this um, as a, um, uh, a curve that goes up linearly and then it bends down and starts to become flat. That's reflecting that patients with a very high degree of depression at baseline are able to get that depression knocked down a lot. So that's why the curve bends that much. And so uh, if you calculate a change score, you'll find the change score varies uh, with the amount of baseline disease and actually doesn't mean at all what you think it means. But if you do a covariate adjustment for a nonlinear effect of baseline to predict the final measurement, you'll get exactly the right answer, and that will be the proper basis for studying heterogeneity of treatment effect. Any question about that? Found almost the exact same thing in the KCCQ quality of life measure. It's used in a lot of heart failure studies. Uh, some patients, like when they get a, a heart valve put in, uh, they can have a major improvement in their quality of life. Um, and patients that just have a little bit of a quality of life problem, they don't get as much benefit. So it's a very nonlinear relationship. Um, and so this is a comment that um, sometimes the baseline is not as relevant as we think, and I'll talk more about that. And then if the treatment is a cure, you know the baseline's irrelevant. So in the extreme case, uh, when if every patient that gets a treatment is cured, the baseline can have no effect, so the slope is zero. So when you do the analysis of covariance, you're gonna cover all the bases. And so this is getting back to Georgette's question again, and it's really just a prototype analysis that covers all of the issues in a very powerful way and so this is in the R RMS package. ORM is just a function for ordinal regression. So this has the Wilcoxon test as a special case. And uh, this is the proportional odds ordinal logistic model in this example. 
and we're going to have the Y, let's say this is the Hamilton D depression scale at 12 weeks. This is the Hamilton D depression scale at time zero or baseline, and we're gonna let it be nonlinear with a restricted euclidic spline function with four change points or knots. And then we're gonna have our treatment effect, and we're gonna get an odds ratio for the treatment. So there's a lot packed into that way of formulating the problem, but I think it's very elegant and very powerful and it has the fewest assumptions of anything. And so you've got the nonlinear effect of baseline. Uh, you've got an ordinal model. And so this can have floor effects and ceiling effects. Same for this. And so this, this Y variable could be continuous and it, or it could be a four level pain scale. Uh, so if you have a four level variable that has a huge floor or ceiling effect, you're gonna have a lot of ties at say a value of one, a lot of ties at four. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that in an ordinal model. And in fact, you could have so many ties in the data that Y has only two values. And then this is exactly binary logistic regression. So you're covering all the bases here. Um, and then you can translate it to means and other things other than odds ratios. And then you can see whether treatment interacts with the baseline and you can plot that in a variety of ways. So anybody have a question about what this type of model is trying to solve? Anybody still there? Uh, I, I had a question. Uh, is the number of knots in the spline function related to the, the degrees on the scale? No. Um, it, well, yeah, it can be. And sometimes the scale is very discrete and we have a lot of trouble knowing where to put knots. This is four default knots at quantiles. And if it's a very discrete scale, I usually just do a quadratic. Maybe you don't have to deal with knots. But the, this number is related more to the sample size than to anything. So the bigger your sample size, the more you can afford a complex model that's more likely to fit the data. Uh, it relates a little bit to how many levels are in the scale, but a little bit more to the sample size. Good question. Any other questions? So this is Stephen Sin's graph, and I think, I think this is really worth pondering. And so what is the relative variance of um, analysis of covariance um, versus analyzing simple change from baseline versus ignoring the baseline completely? Okay, so you're ignoring the baseline completely is your point of reference. So this would be, let's say, a relative efficiency uh, of one, just an arbitrary anchor there. And so if you have a lot of variation in your patients and they have different patients have different baseline values, but you ignore that, uh, you, let's say this is your base efficiency, we're gonna compare that against. What does analysis of change score do? Okay, you can see that relative to completely and utterly ignoring the baseline value, this is really telling here. Uh, the analysis of a change score is worse than completely ignoring the baseline if the baseline is not strongly related to the follow-up measure. This is really a crucial point. So if the correlation between the baseline and the follow-up measure is less than 0.5, then calculating change from baseline uh, is less efficient than completely and utterly ignoring the baseline. So I hope everybody gets that point. In the limit, and we had a, a study being designed where we had this discussion the other day, this might happen. In the limit, the, um, sometimes the baseline measurement is not collected with as much faithfulness or trouble as the follow-up measurement is collected. So sometimes the baseline measurement is noisy. And a change score is going to assume that the baseline measurement is just as important as the outcome measurement and is just as precise. 
And that's not always the case. So in the limit, when your baseline value is so noisy uh, that uh, it hurts you to make use of it, analysis of covariance is going to handle even that case because it's going to estimate a slope of zero for the baseline. And it's going to tell you to ignore the baseline. So here's what happens with analysis of covariance. And so analysis of covariance never loses against anything. It always dominates. So see, it's always has a lower relative variance or at most equal. So the only time it's equal uh, to a change score is when the correlation between the pre and the post is one. Um, and the only time it's equal to ignoring the baseline is when the baseline has zero predictiveness of the uh, follow-up measure. So in this sense, the analysis of covariance is your clear choice because it's never going to lose and it's almost always going to win. So in this region here, you know, it's really all the way to here, it's really winning. So it takes into account noisy baseline. You can make it take into account nonlinear baseline. Um, and it respects the experimental design. So when you are doing a parallel group randomized study, that's designed to compare the parallel groups. And that's exactly what analysis of covariance is doing. So it answers the question, do two patients that start at the same point end up at different points due to treatment? So that's exactly the question you want to be asking in a parallel group randomized trial. If you started at the same point, do you end up at different points, like different blood pressure, due only to the treatment. So analysis of covariance is completely consistent with the experimental design. And um, the analysis of change scores is really inconsistent with the experimental design. So any questions about any of those concepts or the, or the graph? Uh, yes, I have two questions. So the first one is, could you elaborate more about the correlation between the baseline measures and the follow-up measures, what do they actually mean? Do they actually mean that the baseline measures is prognostic of the future outcome? Or if we do see those kind of uh, results in a clinical trial, for example, where we have allocated volunteers into uh, two groups, then we do see that those um, uh, measures are correlated so is that, does that mean that we have, we have not um, stratified our patients correctly or, yeah, so I'm not entirely sure on the implications of the correlation of the baseline and follow-up measures. So when you, when you said correlated and you said two groups, what were you referred to, referring to exactly there, Mikhail? Well, uh, well, not entirely two groups, but I guess, Perhaps we can just, okay, perhaps uh, you can forget that and just, I'm still not entirely sure about the correlation between uh, baseline and follow up. Uh, what do they actually mean? Is that because we are measuring in the same individual? So that's the correlation because we uh, because of repeated measures or what? Well, you could call it repeated measure, but one, one measure is conditioned upon, so it's baseline. So it's really, it's like a longitudinal study with one follow-up, but um, the important thing is really what you said, it's a prognostic relationship. Does the baseline predict the outcome? Just as uh, in studies of uh, where you have widely different ages of patients, uh, age predicts almost every disease outcome you'll ever study. And so if you don't adjust for age, you're, you're missing a great opportunity to explain some of the outcome variation and get a clearer signal. All right, thank you. Here we're talking about, we're not, we're not using age to predict future age, but we're using baseline blood pressure to predict mm -hmm. future blood pressure. And we're talking about the prognostic ability of the baseline variable and, and, and how strong is that relationship. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Any, anybody else? I, my question was like, can, can we use the change in score as outcome variables and the baseline measurement as the covariate in the same model? 
So what, what would be the like the graph? So that that's a great question. And I think, I don't know if the notes address that somewhere else on another page, but the, I think it sends a bad message to present an analysis like that to an investigator. And the reason I say that is they will start to expect you to do such analyses in the future. And when you get to an ordinal outcome, you cannot do that analysis anymore. So it creates a discontinuity in your, in your thinking. So if you had a four level pain scale, uh, it is not valid to calculate the change from baseline. Not Forget whether you analyze it, it's not valid to even calculate it. So, you, so the, the idea of using the baseline in, in the outcome measure and as an adjustment variable only works in a very special case where you have a linear model and then you have a roughly normal distribution. So you have to have a very continuous variable with the difference being very symmetric, like symmetric about the mean difference. So the fact that you can rescue the change from baseline in, by including the baseline as a covariate, um, that is a very narrow scope because that only applies to linear models. It doesn't apply anywhere else. Um, and I think it's also hard to interpret. So if you have to explain to an investigator, why did the baseline measurement appear twice in the model? Why does it appear on the right-hand side of the model and the left-hand side of the model? It's actually not easy to explain that to someone. And I think, I think the reason it's hard to explain is because it doesn't make a lot of sense to think that way. I don't know if that's convincing to you. Thank you. So I, I don't like to do things that are special cases because when you get to the, the general way of doing it, you know, you don't, you're not tempted to put Y minus Y zero over here because Y zero is already taken care of. And if your outcome is ordinal, uh, the difference in two ordinal variables is no longer ordinal. So you can't really use this model very well. So there's just a lot of reasons to think differently about this and to keep things in their place. This is on the right hand side. This is a baseline variable. It's not part of the follow-up. This is the follow-up. Any other questions about this? This is a really different topic that just, it's another example of how change from baseline can get you into trouble due to non-linear relationships and in fact, uh, we, have a min we have many relationships that are not monotonic. So this is the example with serum creatinine and the uh, acute kidney injury. There's an article about this on datamethods.org that discusses this in more detail. The, the definition of acute kidney injury has never been validated. And in fact, data will invalidate the measure. And so it really has a lot of problems and it's the serum creatinine is not something that works by subtraction and it's not something that works by ratios. It doesn't work either way. And so the definition for acute kidney injury based on changes in creatinine uh, or ratios of creatinine is just never, never have been well thought out. So things get worse uh, when you, um, you have nonlinear effects, but here's an example where you take everybody that survived past day three in the intensive care unit. And you measure their serum creatinine for their kidney function on day three. And you see it's extremely nonlinear effect here. Uh, we're using a logistic regression to predict hospital death. And then um, we have a, a chi-score of 108. That's how much of the outcome variation is explained by the day three, the last measurement at baseline. And then how much additional predictive information is there in day one? Well, it's only a chi-square of 20. So if you were gonna calculate this minus this, you're giving these two things equal weight. And this analysis shows clearly that they should not get equal weight. If you wanted to get a better model than subtracting the two, you would just completely ignore the day one measurement. Um, and so the, um, 
the, in almost everything you measure with patients, the last measurement dominates the prediction of the future. The last measurement is far and away the most important one to know. Uh, the initial measurement adds a little, but not, not very much. Um, this is the relationship. If you allowed a, uh, sex to interact with serum creatinine, looks like you don't really need to. Uh, and just as a side um, comment, a lot of people use glomerular filtration rate, GFR, in analysis instead of serum creatinine. And that is, has correction factors in it for sex, age, and race. And using this data set, you can show some evidence that the GFR overcorrects for those variables. In other words, if you, if you plot a GFR here, you may see an interaction with sex and on the creatinine scale, we don't see an interaction with sex. Um, and so uh, the creatinine variable may be better, uh, a better variable for certain purposes. But the main point here is not that. The point here is you have a term. So you have this hockey stick relationship. 20% um, of the US population has a serum creatinine below 0.8. They're out in here. And there is indication that they're at increased risk. And so if you're looking at change from baseline or acute kidney injury, if you say somebody went from a, the optimum serum creatinine you can possibly have is about 1.1. If somebody went from 1.1 to 2, it looks like they're, they're in danger. If they went from 0.8 to 1.2, uh, it doesn't really look like they're in danger. Now, a a physician could tell you there's a lot more to this story because it depends on what else is going on. But this is something that should be taken into account is when you have a non-monotonic relationship, looking at ratios or change from baseline can be uh, very confusing, if not misleading. Uh, any questions about what that analysis is showing? So I think it's important to relate our variables to some ultimate outcome because that helps you understand the scaling and maybe the transformation that you need for the variable. So I'm not going to spend much time with percent change. It's just more problematic because it's not a symmetric measure. Um, and so you'll, you'll hear people make this mistake all the time. They say the stock market went down by 10%. If it, if it raises by 10%, I'll get back to where I was. And that's not the case. That's a misunderstanding of, of percent change. And so if you're ever tempted to do things proportionally, it's going to be a lot clearer to just stick with ratios. And if you want them to act kind of linearly, you want to deal with log ratios. So ratios, the log ratio is a very symmetric measure. So if something goes up, uh, if something goes up by uh, 1.5, it needs to go down by a factor of 1.5 to get back to where you started. So that's what this sort of thing uh, is talking about. And then there's some um, ideas for choosing effect measures, but really, unless you have a pre-post study, we shouldn't be doing this. We should really be not, not needing a change score outside of a simple pre-post design. So uh, these are just very simple examples and looking at transformations. And then regression to the mean, we've already talked about, and this is such a, a far-reaching phenomenon. It affects our daily lives. And um, we observe things that aren't true all the time. We observe things where the sample size was too small, um, or we observed something and we were impressed with it because somebody was doing atypically well for themselves. Um, and so this was a classic example where you take baseball players early in the season and you look at how much, if they've had 45 opportunities to get a hit, they've had 45 at bats, uh, they all have the same denominator and you see this huge variance. And the batters who started out really high, they, they have more room to go down than they have to go up. So you can see regression to the mean. This is their final uh, proportion of hits for the whole rest of the season. So that's many hundreds of at-bats. 
And you see that these, these numbers here vary a lot less than these numbers here. That's regression to the mean. So if you identify somebody because they're running high, uh, they'll tend to run lower as you get more data. If you identify somebody that's running low, they'll tend to be higher when you get more data. That's just regression to the mean. And so you don't want to attribute uh, the outcome of some intervention to nothing but regression to the mean. We see this mistake made. One of the worst examples I've ever seen was an, an abstract published from a Northeastern uh, Medical Center, who shall be nameless, where um, they were trying to prevent the patients from being needing to be readmitted to the hospital after their discharge. So they took uh, a, a series of uh, 100 or so patients who had had multiple admissions in the previous year. So they qualified for the study because they had more than, say, 10 admissions at that hospital in the previous year. They, they intervened with social workers and they followed them for how many hospitalizations they needed in the next year. And they showed that the number of hospitalizations in the next year was lower than the number of hospitalizations in the previous year. Well, that's, that's you could have given the patients weather reports and they had the same intervention effect as what they achieved. That's nothing but regression to the mean because you had to have a high number here to qualify to get into the study. And so the idea of looking at change from baseline when you don't have a second baseline or you don't correct for regression to the mean is just uh, really, really problematic. Now this is a way to correct for false variability. This is using a shrinkage estimate or James Stein estimator, empirical base. You could do it with formal base. And so this is just borrowing information from one player to another and giving a better estimate of their ultimate outcome. So we're discounting a lot of the individual data. We're shrinking them to the grand mean of all the batters. And now we have variation that's too little. So we go from variation that's too big, that's false variation, to over shrunk variation. But this variation here is closer to that variation than, it, than it's closer to this variation here. So even with over shrinking, we have superior predictions for every single batter. These, these circles are closer uh, to the final gold standard result than they are to using these numbers. So this is still using the only, the first 45 at bats, but it's applying a shrinkage technique to correct uh, for uh, measurement error or regression to the mean in this case. So any questions about regression to the mean? It's, it's all important and you'll see a lot of people get excited about something getting better. Um, like in the cold study, the reason patients' cold symptoms uh, get better after you start any treatment is the cold, the cold hardly ever lasts more than two weeks. It's going to get better and the patient enrolled in the study because they had cold symptoms. So you have really almost nowhere to go but improve. And that's, that's nothing but regression to the mean. So that really covers what I want to cover. I'm just leave a little time for a few more questions. Anybody have any issues or any, any of this not clear or some of it you don't believe? That's fine. So what I hope you'll take with you, th this is one of the biggest take home messages is this graph and these seven assumptions. And I have a lot of trouble getting the idea of change scores out of clinicians' heads. If you find any other ammunition that you, you find uh, adds to the argument, please share it with all of us. Uh, and I'd love to add that to the notes. Uh, but this is one of the most frustrating things I deal with 
And it, it just doesn't make any sense that somebody would want to use something that gives you uh, artifacts in the analysis. It gives you false heterogeneity of treatment effect. It makes the sample size need to be bigger. Um, it's really a lose, lose, lose situation to use change from baseline in a parallel group study, uh, whether it's a randomized study or not. So hearing no further questions, we will stop here. And there's the discussion board topic on datamethods.org for this particular topic. Please continue any questions or discussions there. And I really uh, thank you for being here. Uh, excuse me, I have a question, sorry. Yes. Uh, so if you analyze, for example, the longitudinal data with linear mixed model, do you still have to adjust for this baseline effect by putting the baseline value at the right-hand side of the formula? So, so there's a long section of that in my regression modeling strategies course notes. So if you just look on that on my website, there's a very long description of that and extreme, extremely detailed arguments. And so the bottom line is you're in a longitudinal study, you want your baseline variable to appear only on the right-hand side of the model. Okay. You want, you want your left-hand side of the model to be your repeated measurement starting post baseline. So oh. whether, you're, whether you're doing a mixed effects model, a marginal model, or a, a generalized least squares uh, method, it doesn't matter. You want, you want the baseline to appear in one place. And you may want it to be non-linearly modeled. So to further clarify, if you have three time points, then at the left hand side would be the, uh, well, time point one being the baseline. So the at the left hand side would be time point two and three, and the right hand side would be the time point one, which is the baseline. You're right. And just to make it super clear, if you, if you really label, label those time zero, time one, and time two, uh, because I, I just, I'm in the habit of using zero for baseline. So time zero is on the right hand side. Okay. Time one and time two are on the left hand side. All right. Thank you. Yeah, good. it's a great question. So look at those other course notes, covers that particular question in tremendous detail. Okay, thanks everybody for being here and please uh, bring questions to the discussion board and hope to see you at a future session. Thank you. All right, thank you.